Alors, bonjour. Bonjour tout le monde. How's the sound? Like this? Like that? OK, perfect. Bonjour tout le monde, je suis Véronique Couillard et je vous souhaite la bienvenue à la Galerie d'art d'Ottawa. Merci d'être venu prendre le thé avec nous. Hello, my name is Véronique Couillard and on behalf of the Ottawa Art Gallery, I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us this afternoon for Art and Tea at the OAG. Kwe, Pijashik, Odawa, Ojichigan, Wabandahe, Tawegamik, Ate, Anishinabe Akin, Egawikod, Ka, Poke de The Ottawa Art Gallery operates on the beautiful Anishinabe Aki. The Anishinaabe have been on this territory, known today as the city of Ottawa, since the beginning of time. All sorts of art forms have been and continue to be part of the vibrant Anishinaabe culture. Je prends un moment pour saluer la nation Anishinaabe, car nous nous trouvons aujourd'hui sur ces terres non cédées qui fournit à la culture de nombreuses sources d'inspiration. Our program will begin with opening remarks about our latest exhibition, Visions and Views, Landscape and Abstraction in the Firestone Collection of Canadian Art, followed by the presentation, Looking Beneath the Layers, with OAG Chief Curator, Rebecca Bassiano, and CCI Scientific Documentation Technologists, Germaine Wiseman. The presentation will be about 30 minutes, and will be followed by our annual Firestone Chat with OAG Director and CEO, Alexandra Badzak. It will conclude with a Q&A with the public. Je serai disponible pour faire de l'interprétation durant la période de questions si nécessaire. La présentation se déroulera en anglais. The presentation portion of the talk will be recorded and kept for future access. Veuillez noter que la présentation sera filmée pour des archives publiques. So please make yourself comfortable and of course help yourself to tea and refreshments on each table or as well as at the back of the room. And before I do introductions, I want to take a moment to thank our funders. Je vais prendre un petit moment pour dire merci à nos bailleurs de fonds qui uh, soutiennent notre programmation. La Ville d'Ottawa, the City of Ottawa, le Conseil des Arts du Canada, Canada Council for the Arts, et le Conseil des Arts de l'Ontario, also the Ontario Arts Council. And now, I am pleased to welcome Megan Ho, Assistant Curator at OAG and Curator of the exhibition Visions in Views. Alors voici Megan Ho, qui a organisé l'exposition À perte de vue, le paysage et l'abstraction dans la collection Firestone d'art canadien, dont nous fêtons aujourd'hui l'ouverture. Megan? Merci, Véro, and thank you all for joining us today. I am thrilled to be here to celebrate and introduce the opening of our new exhibition in the Firestone Gallery on Level 2, Visions and Views. Spanning the modern period and including over 1,600 pieces from a wide range of styles, regions, and time periods, the Firestone Collection of Canadian Art, or FCCA, is a significant collection that was established by the Firestone family in the early 1950s. In 1972, the Firestone generously donated it to the Ontario Heritage Foundation to ensure its accessibility to the public, and two decades later, ownership of the FCCA was transferred to the City of Ottawa. Since then, the OAG has been responsible for its conservation and public display as we care for and present the collections in a series of rotating exhibitions. This year, Visions and Views is an exhibition focused on the two largest themes that are represented within the collection, works of landscape and abstraction. Within the gallery, you'll find vibrant landscape views from across the country, alongside dynamic abstract visions and explorations, as the show looks at the history of Canadian art as represented through the collection practice, collecting practices of the Firestone family. In Visions and Views, we're delighted to have the opportunity to showcase a wide breadth of work from the collection, as well as highlight important um, sorry, show important highlights, such as the work that will be a focus of our Art and Tea program today. Visions and Views will be on till early 2025, and I invite you to visit the exhibition on the second floor. And now, 
I am pleased to introduce today's program as part of our annual Firestone chat series. Looking beneath the layers, our presentation today will explore the use of photography in scientific research on historical artwork through documentation and analysis of one of the works in the Firestone collection, Mount Thule, Bylot Island by Lauren Harris. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming OAG's chief curator, Rebecca Bassiano, and scientific documentation technologist from the Canadian Conservation Institute, Jermaine Wiseman. Hello, everyone. Can we hear me better like this? I'm going to have to, like, we're very tall, <laughs> so I'm going to, if. Give me a signal if you can't hear. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming out today. It's lovely to see the room full like this. Um, so my name is, is Rebecca Bassiano. And my name is Jermaine Wiseman. Uh, we're very excited to present our talk, Looking Beneath the Layers, Exploring Documentation and Analysis of Mount Thule, Violet Island by Lauren Harris uh, from the Firestone Collection of Canadian Art. During this talk, uh, we will look beneath the layers of the painting and explore the use of photography in scientific research of historical artwork. So now just a bit of a disclaimer. If we're a bit informal, familiar, abrupt, uh, it's because we're married. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is an actually super rare instance where our paths have crossed in a professional capacity, which is super fun. Um, we're in a similar field, but we're approaching this work from different perspectives. So um, if you want like a TV like crime metaphor, I'd be like the lead detective, and Jermaine would be like the forensic scientist. <laughs> um, but in real life, uh, I'm a scientific documentation technologist at the Canadian Conservation Institute. The Canadian Conservation Institute, otherwise known as CCI, is a part of the Canadian heritage. Um, we advance and promote the conservation of Canadian heritage collections through conservation science, treatment, and preventative conservation. We serve uh, institutes across Canada, but we're actually located here in Ottawa. And as the chief curator at the Ottawa Art Gallery, I'm always looking to deepen our research and knowledge about works in our collection. So uh, this work here, uh, Mount Julie, Violet Island by Lauren Harris, is one of the most beloved works in our collection, in the Firestone Collection of Canadian Art. And through recent investigations, we've discovered secrets hidden beneath its surface. But before I get to that, I'd like to provide a bit of context on the life of work of Lauren Harris. So in the early years, he studied in Berlin, and it was there that he learned about Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, and also became interested in the philosophy of theosophy. He then came back to Toronto, and around 1910, he started painting urban scenes. In Toronto, he also joined the Arts and Letters Club, which you may have heard of, and he met fellow artist G.H. MacDonald. The two of them undertook many sketching trips together, um, and in 1913, they visited an exhibition of contemporary Scandinavian art, uh, winter paintings, at the Albright Ga Gallery in Buffalo. Harris was so inspired by this exhibition that he turned his attention completely to the creation of a Canadian landscape tradition. So Harris was born into wealth of the Massey Harris farm machinery manufacturing business. So as such, he was able to help finance the construction of a studio building in Toronto with his friend James McCallum, providing a cheap space for like-minded artists like him to work. He also helped finance a series of boxcar sketching trips to the Algoma region with other artists like J.H. McDonald and Frank Johnston. And this is a beautiful work of the Alcalma region from our collection. And then in May 1920, he was instrumental in the founding of the Group of Seven. Uh, they had their first exhibition at the Art Gallery of Toronto later that year. And the group traveled to Algoma uh, many times. Uh, in 1921, Harris uh, and fellow artist A.Y. Jackson went beyond Algoma to Lake Superior's North Shore. And compared to his earlier works, 
Uh, these paintings of Lake Superior are more simplified, more sublime, with more muted uh, color palette. In 1924, he went on a sketching trip with Jackson to the Rockies, marking the beginning of his mountain phase. And in 1930, he traveled to Greenland, the Canadian Arctic, and Labrador aboard a Royal Canadian Mounted Police supply ship and, and icebreaker uh, for two months. So, and during these two months, as part of this trip, he completed over 50 sketches. And so this is the context for OEG's work. It falls right within this period of that 1930 trip. Mount Thule is located on Violet Island in Nunavut and it's one of the highest peaks in the Baffin Mountains. So in 1934, shortly after this, this trip, Harris moved to the United States, first to Hanover, New Hampshire, and then to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it's at this point forward that Harris completely embraced abstraction, or at least more than ever before. Um, he often played classical music in the background while he was painting, and like Kandinsky, the idea of rhythm is mirrored in his compositions. Through this aesthetic, he wanted to depict the sensations and experiences of nature and life. He had been cu curious about abstraction, though, as early as the 1920s. So while he's sort of forming the Group of Seven um, and painting with them, he's still, he's thinking about abstraction already. And his move from landscape to abstraction is actually a lot more gradual than is generally believed. So I'll give you an example. Uh, this work here, you can see sort of an amalgamation of the two, of abstraction and landscape, which, by the way, is super suitable to the Visions and Views exhibition <laughs> currently on view, which sort of looks at this sort of landscape abstraction uh, uh, combination. Um, but as you can see here, uh, it seems to be a push and pull, deep space, flat painted surface, but then it's also sort of one of those winter scenes uh, and one of those uh, mountains as well. So I also wanted to note that just like his landscapes, the process of sketches and studies play an important role in his abstractions as well. Uh, this work here that you see was done in New Mexico at the time that he founded another group uh, which you might not have known, the Transcendental Painting Group. So this group promoted a pure abstract painting style with theosophical spiritual intent moving beyond the physical into concepts of space, light, and design. So after sort of being in the US and forming this abstract group, he moved to Vancouver in 1940 and lived there until his death until 1970, all the while continuing in abstraction. So when he comes back to Canada, he found out that it was his earlier works uh, that were still selling to collectors, and he's still doing lectures and articles about this earlier development of Canadian art, and his abstractions were very underappreciated. And so while most of us today are familiar with Harris's associations with the Group of Seven, that period in his career is actually quite short compared to his period of abstraction, which was about 35 years. So if you'd like to learn more about his abstractions, there's a book, I'm gonna shamelessly plug. There's, this is not our book, but it is for sale in the OEG shop. Um, and it's called Lauren Harris Higher States. And our shop is on floor one. And I, I, I'm promoting it because there's very few books out there about his abstractions, right? There's countless books about his time with the group of seven, but sort of if you wanna sort of look at some of those images of his abstractions, I would definitely recommend that. So back to the work in question. In our database, we always had the date on this work as circa or about 1930. Um, this was based on the subject matter uh, of the work and the assumption that it was created shortly after that 1930 trip to the Arctic. However, over the years, OEG staff, as well as visiting experts, have observed interesting textures in the work and raised some questions about possible layers underneath the surface. Uh, are there markings or even a composition underneath? And so to answer this question, we sent the work to CCI for deeper analysis. 
So I just want to talk a little bit about scientific imaging. So scientific imaging is usually beyond the means of conventional photography, since it often employs incredibly high resolution cameras, full spectrum sensors, uh, specialized lights that emit uh, specific wavelengths, uh, three dimensional cameras and scanners, and often non-camera imaging equipment, including radiography. Uh, this specific painting, Mount Thule, Baila Island by Lauren Harris, was documented at CCI using 10 different scientific imaging methods, which I'll be walking uh, you through today. So the first imaging method is called normal visible light photography. Uh, it's recorded in the visible spectrum and is uh, what the human eye can see. Uh, there's even lighting across the surface of this work. Uh, for scientific applications, it's ideal for interpreting colors and tones and is used as a base reference for comparing different imaging methods. So in addition to looking at the front of the work, I'd also like to point out the frame and the back of the work, something the public usually doesn't see. Harris uh, wrote on the back of the handmade silver painted frame uh, the markings indicate that the frame was cut down more than once, and he reused it for other works. So, and this was very common of Harris to sort of reuse materials. Um, according to our files, the spaces were added by a conservator when the work came into OAG, so that the work would fit better in the frame, because obviously it had been cut down several times, it wasn't made for it. It's interesting to note, however, that the spaces are made from wine bottle corks. <laughs> I bet you didn't think that wine corks were behind some of the works you're looking at in a gallery. <laughs> and often the back of the works, you also find labels, you see a label there, which indicates sort of the exhibition history. And in this case, uh, it's because the work was included in a group exhibition um, to do with the Group of Seven at the National Gallery of Canada. Great. So uh, this next imaging method is called raking light photography. Uh, it's just a single light used uh, and is placed at a very low angle to the painting's surface. Uh, the harsh angle and high contrast of the light enhances the surface topography, uh, revealing uh, textured brush strokes, uh, pigment accretions, and surface damage. So here I've included uh, the normal uh, visible light image on the left just to help interpret uh, what's happening with the uh, raking visible light on the right. So there are numerous topographical features visible in the raking light image uh, which are unrelated to the overall composition. So here at the bottom of the painting, we can see that there are four swirls that have a bit of relief. Can you all see those swirls? Yeah. Right. Uh, next, we can see that there's an irregularly shaped relief on the left side, which runs diagonally and appears to have ridges and peaks. There are also vertical relief lines on the left and right side of the canvas. Uh, an inverted V-shaped relief is visible on the summit of the far right um, uh, snow-capped mountain. Um, all of these features are inconsistent with the composition that we see um, on the surface here. So this next imaging method is called specular visible light photography. Uh, it uses extremely uh, frontal lighting, which creates a strong glare on the painting surface. Although this might not be ideal when you want to get like a nice photo of a painting, um, but this direct lighting reveals differences in uh, surface uh, sheen and texture. So again, um, we see the large swirl shaped brush strokes at the bottom of the painting. Um, we also see the irregularly shaped um, object on the, oh, on the left side uh, with ridges and peaks. And this supports what we see in the uh, visible raking light image. 
The next imaging method uh, is called transmit at visible light photography. Uh, two lights are uh, positioned behind the painting and directed at the back of the canvas. The camera is positioned in front of the work, uh, facing the painting, uh, and the boundaries around the painting are masked so that only light which is transmitted through the canvas can be recorded. Uh, the painting was supported on a translucent easel that's been custom built for this purpose that you can see on the right. Um, so we see, uh, we can see an inverted V on the summit of a far right snow-capped mountain. Again, there's also significant cracking that follows this V shape. Uh, we can see that there is another larger inverted V at the top left section of the painting. Uh, like the previous shape, this one also has significant cracking. On the left side of the irregularly, there is the irregular shape with ridges and peaks. Um, and we see this because the paint is thick and blocks the light in that area. Uh, we again see the vertical lines on the left and the right side of the canvas. So these next uh, two imaging methods are in the infrared spectrum. Uh, this spectrum we can't, can't be seen with the human eye, but can be seen with a digital camera. And fun fact, several animals can see infrared, including salmon, which use infrared to better navigate dark salt water. I love this, because if a salmon came into the gallery, this is what he would see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Infrared light penetrates under the surface of the painting and reveals hidden features like underdrawings and brush strokes. Certain materials such as graphite and carbon absorb infrared and appear dark in the image. Uh, and any pencil markings on the painting will be seen. So with the reflected infrared, uh, we can see some compositional changes. Uh, Harris reworked the mountain on the right side several times. You see there. Uh, he also made changes to the shape of the cloud. Uh, we can again see the irregular shape with ridges and peaks on the left side. And we also see that there's a grid drawn with graphite. Uh. Press it once more. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Mm. Uh, so Harris commonly used grids. And here's an example which shows his process in the making of Mount Lefroy. Uh, he'd often do a painted sketch um, and graphic drawing before the final big canvas. Um, he was really working through process. And you can see in each iteration of the process, he's still like developing his ideas before he gets to that final canvas. Um, so knowing that there was a grid underneath Mount Tuli, I went looking for a sketch, and I found the sketch for it in the Vancouver Art Gallery. The sketch seems to be longer and less square than the final work. Um, in addition, what's interesting about the grid is that the squares are slightly like uneven on the left side. Um, perhaps he was trying to condense the left side. This is a guess, but it also might account for like why he was reworking the mountains on the right. Um, so taking one format and putting it into a more square format. Uh, so this next imaging method is called transmitted infrared. Uh, it's a setup where the painting is backlit, similar to transmitted visible light of photography. Uh, however, a special filters mounted to the camera lens, which allows um, infrared to be recorded. Uh, this reveals similar things to reflect the infrared setup, but since it's being transmitted through the canvas, uh, it shows deeper subsurface features. Uh, the first thing that I noticed was this broccoli or mushroom shaped uh, uh, feature on the left side of the canvas. Um, this aligns with the irregularly shaped, irregular shape with ridges that we've previously been seeing. Um, and the next thing that I noticed that there were some shapes that seemed to be um, scratched out. Yeah. Uh, however, it's hard to tell what these are. Are they scratched out drawings or notations? 
Are they areas of paint that Harris tried to remove? I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, so it is known though that Harris did scrape off some of his works. So in preparation for the talk, I reached out to Alec Blair, who's the director of the Lorenus Harris Inventory Project. Uh, he's working with the estate to put together a comprehensive catalog of Harris's works. And Blair was super helpful to us in putting this talk together and was very generous with his research. And he noted to us several examples where Harris would scrape off a landscape in order to create an abstract over top. So this is an example here. Um, it should like, look like what's on the right. So he, there are notations on the back of all his works. Number 36 goes with, you know, board number 36. So we know that the board did have mountains, mm -hmm. but it has been scraped off in order to do this abstract over top. And he did this quite a bit. Um, and sometimes um, he would use sort of, he'd scrape it off and use the mountains as a departure point to make those abstracts, um, but then not wanting the viewer to, to realize that he's uh, making nature the, the referential point. Okay, the next imaging method here is called visibly induced IR luminescence. Uh, this is a unique technique that uses luminescence, uh, which is where you illuminate an object in one spectrum and it causes a glowing in another spectrum. So when certain pigments, notably those containing cadmium, are exposed to uh, visible blue light, it causes luminescence in the infrared region. Uh, this allows for mapping of certain pigments across the surface of the painting. Uh, here we see um, specific areas around the leftmost mountain where cadmium paint was applied. Uh, cadmium is a toxic metal which is used to make vivid uh, paint colors uh, and is yellow and orange um, and is the yellow and orange that you see in the various places in this work. Uh, the shape is very jagged and seems to follow the swirls and the irregular shape that we've uh, previously seen in other images. Uh, next, the vertical lines that we also saw in uh, previous images on the left side of the painting also um, are likely cadmium. Uh, we see a new uh, wavy line that appears to be cadmium as well at the top. So what's interesting is that uh, the luminescence appears in several places where we see orange with our naked eyes. So there's like a little bit of, you know, people think that Harris's works are very blue and cold, but in this case, he has this layer of orange underneath to create that warmth. But what's interesting is that it's not in all, like the, it's not luminescing in all the places that we see orange with the naked eye. So here's an example on screen. Uh, it's not lighting up on that large mountain and we can visibly see that orange. So the way that we are rectifying this is that the markings underneath were done in one type of pigment and then he painted over top of them with another non-cadmium based orange to create what we see on the surface. And again, this is very typical of Harris. So he would rework his painting at different points of time, perhaps picking up a different kind of pigment. Um, he was known to have never been finished a work. So he would like gift a work to friends or family, come over to visit and like take out his paintbrush and like keep going. <laughs> uh, so this uh, next imaging method is called ultraviolet fluorescence. Uh, this is the fun lighting that uh, is used in glow in the dark mini golf. Uh, so you might. We should have done a mini golf picture here, yeah. but we didn't. Can find one. <laughs> <laughs> um, the painting is illuminated with UV light, uh, which cannot be seen by the human eye. But when certain materials are exposed to this UV light, it causes a shift in energy and emits visible light, a uh, glow called fluorescence. Uh, the fluorescence is recorded with camera in the visible spectrum. It's often used to identify areas that have been retouched, uh, and it's also used to show, mater uh, show materials that are transparent and thus are difficult to see, such as varnishes and adhesives. Uh, the first thing that I noticed when, uh, was that this triangle, or what looks to be an eye, became more pronounced. 
Uh, next, I noticed the large inverted V uh, shape is clearer as well. Uh, the vertical brush strokes on the left and right are also more apparent. Um, and by the way, the abstract formation that Jermaine just called an eye can be seen in several of Harris's abstracts, including this sketch, which is actually in OAG's collection. So the next imaging method is called ultraviolet reflectance. Uh, here we are looking at a painting in the ultraviolet spectrum, uh, which, is not, which is not visible to the human eye, but is visible to birds and butterflies, and lucky for us, cameras. Uh, what is recorded is the invisible ultraviolet light. Retouching and repairs are often evident. Uh, also, certain pigments uh, absorb UV light differently um, and can be used to distinguish between colors that appear the same in visible light, such as titanium white, zinc white, and lead white. So I've included a sample target that I made, uh, which shows the, uh, the different types of white paint, um, what, what it looks like under UV. And by comparing these to the painting, we see that the uh, white clouds and mountaintops are either lead white, zinc white, but are not titanium white, uh, since titanium white appears black under UV. Uh, we can also see that there's been some very minor retouching that's happened at the top of the painting. So the final imaging method that I'll, I'll show is computed radiography. Uh, it is a digital x-ray imaging process, and if you've ever had your teeth x-rayed, it's a very similar type of x-ray. Uh, however, it's on the industrial level and uses a lot more energy. Um, this means that we can see through heavier and thicker materials. Um, this system uses a digital plate that is scanned after it's exposed to x-rays. And here's the setup here. Uh, as we can see here in this photo on the right, the plate was positioned directly under the painting and the x-ray tube was positioned above the painting. The tones of the image reflect the difference in absorption of the x-rays by the painting. As radiation passes through the material, it's absorbed based on its thickness and density. To correctly interpret the image, uh, it's important to understand that heavy elements appear lighter whereas light elements appear darker. So the first thing that we can see in this radiograph is the stretcher and the many nails holding it to, uh, holding canvas to the frame. I was gonna count them all, but no. Um, the next thing that we see uh, that I'd like to point out are the swirls, which make another appearance at the bottom of the painting. Um, finally, um, these two regions at the bottom, uh, which are very light in the radiograph, are very dense, which could mean that there's uh, thick or multiple layers of paint. Um, so are these features of the painting, um, uh, sorry, are there features of this painting uh, that are thickly painted over uh, that we can't see? At the top of the painting, uh, we can see what looks to be the top of the large inverted V uh, that we've seen in the other images. So based on these imaging methods, I compiled the results into one image. And there's also a simplified version. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so patterns start to emerge, and so we went searching for other known works that have these same patterns. Uh, the semicircles, vertical lines, wave-like patterns can be seen in many of his, his abstractions, um, mostly his abstractions from the late 1950s. And with the help of Alec Blair, we found a work with the exact same semicircles. Um, if this is one of those scratched off works too, where it used to be a landscape and he, Harris scraped it off uh, in the late 1950s to create this sketch here. 
Uh, notice also that there are grid lines behind this abstract. If we rotate the work, you can see these semicircles more clearly. And even the triangular shape on the left, as well as the waves on the top. And this pattern can also clearly be seen in other works. Uh, it was obviously an idea that he was developing in the mid to late 50s um, and is in line with his style and uh, his ideas of the time. So while it's known that Harris would scrape off his landscapes in order to do an abstraction, we do have an example where it is done in the reverse. So this is a photo um, uh, of Harris's studio. And uh, this sort of discovery is uh, credit to Alec Blair. Um, he noticed sort of that work on the, uh, on the palette there. If we sort of enhance that picture, this is what you see on the left. Um, so Blair went looking for a larger work that corresponded to this and actually found it underneath this landscape painting. So visible to the eye and perhaps a little bit of that raking light Jermaine was talking about. Can you see that circle underneath? So while Harris went through phases of aesthetic development in his practice, what's evident is that he returned to landscape on and off throughout his career. So while he was doing landscapes, he was still scraping some of them off and returning to his sort of traditional landscapes. Uh, so again, just big thanks to Alec Blair as well as the Harris Estate. So if you or someone you know has a work by Harris, please do get in touch. Go to the website here um, because it will help with further research and talks like this. I would, those works that I showed that had that, those similar markings were from private collections. So what are our conclusions here? Well, the markings underneath, are they a complete composition? More than one composition, it is really hard to tell. Uh, but since the x-rays show dense areas at the bottom, it's possible he covered up even more that we cannot see, that he was reworking this canvas and ideas uh, several times. But what I think we can say for certain is that underneath Mount Thule are abstract forms that Harris was working with in the mid-1950s, when his abstractions became more fluid with rounded forms and less emphasis on deep space. While most of his paintings in the North were done shortly after that 1930 trip, I would say that most likely he kept that sketch from the 1930s and then decided to paint it large in the 1950s, well after he had moved into abstraction. So we'll end by saying that while this scientific analysis offers so much insight into the work, it cannot replace standing in front of it, and you can go see it in Visions and Views currently, I'm pointing at, currently on the second floor, and I encourage you to go take a look. Um, Harris is noted as saying, quote, we cannot discover the spirit of a work of art by dissecting it any more than an anatomist can find life or consciousness by dissecting the body. So the spirit of this work will continue to inspire visitors to the gallery while the secrets lie hidden beneath. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, wonderful. So on behalf of the Ottawa Art Gallery, I want to thank everyone again for, for joining us today. Uh, I think it's been just such an amazing journey uh, on an artwork. We've often said that the Firestone Collection of Canadian Art uh, is, is just a, a, a treasure that just keeps on giving in terms of our understanding of, of the Canadian art canon. But it's wonderful to dig very deeply into one particular work, especially uh, a work uh, by an artist that's so famous, uh, Lauren Harris from the Group of Seven. You think in many ways he's, he's probably the one artist who we know the most about, uh, and yet there's so much more uh, to learn about his practice, and so it was wonderful by both research and, and science that we were able to dig deeply uh, into, his, into his practice uh, and into his, in his philosophy, uh, and it really, really gave us a new insight 
I guess, into the work. I will say that we, uh, we had often put this work as circa 1930s. So that's gonna change, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the oh, yeah, the label will now change. Uh, in fact, after this talk, since it will be recorded, we'll put a QR code in the gallery right beside it so people can know the story. And it will say circa, no, it will say mid-1950s, that's what it will say, <laughs> of a 1930s, yeah, I haven't figured it out yet, of a 1930s subject. <laughs> Yeah. And this is sort of new for us. And by the way, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Alexandra Badzak, the <laughs> director of the Ottawa Art Gallery. Uh, we like to have the Firestone chat every year. It's now become a bit of an annual thing for us uh, so that we, again, we can sort of find some great stories uh, through this collection. So I'm going to ask the question that, that's probably pre prevalent in a lot of people's <laughs> minds. How do we know that this is a Harris work? Right. So this is definitely a Harris work. Uh, for many reasons. It's very consistent, as I hope you will see, with his style in the 1930s, but also the style underneath is very consistent with his aesthetics, his choice of canvas, the writing on the back of the frame, uh, all very consistent, the pigments with a Lauren Harris work. Yeah. And then, yeah, exactly. So we've got those little little treats, uh, mm -hmm. especially when you were showing us the the back of the canvas that really starts to reveal some of some of those aspects. So we know that uh, O.J. Firestone um, really enjoyed getting to know artists. Uh, so he would spend time uh, building up friendship. He had a very strong friendship with A.Y. Jackson in particular. Um, did he know Harris? Yeah, uh, he did. So. I think there's a statistic that about 90% of the artworks in the Firestone collection of Canadian art were purchased directly from the artists themselves. So the Firestones really did make an effort to become friends with, or at least really know the artists that they were collecting. So they did know Harris. Uh, they, you know, OJ would travel to his house. The Algoma picture, which I, which I showed you on screen that's in our collection, there's a story behind that. They went into Harris's house and he said, oh, what do you have for, for sale? Uh, and they went down to the basement, Harris's basement, and they were looking through works and they opened up this box and they found this work and Harris was like, oh, yeah, I completely forgot about that one. <laughs> and then Firestone purchased it. So definitely uh, this work would have been in the th same lines as that going into Harris's home and purchasing it directly from him. Right, yeah. right, exactly. And so we know that Harris is probably one of the most famous Canadian artists out there, and certainly on the art market, has done fairly well, and, yeah. and certainly recently with you know, the attention that Steve Martin and, and a lot of other uh, folks uh, have you know, provided him attention. What do we sense uh, has been the change in value over the years? Mm -hmm. So this work, I think in the mid-90s was about worth about $84,000. And I was looking for my notes before, but I think it's now worth $3.5 million. Uh, and so Harris certainly has had a lot of interest in the art market, especially starting in the early 2000s. And his work has broken the Canadian art market records time after time, several times. And uh, of course, the interest from Steve Martin, our celebrity, in the work of Harris's work and in him co-curating the show Idea of North uh, has certainly had an interest internationally by collectors as well. And do we think that this analysis will change the value of this work? Not at all. I think it's more interesting from an educational point of view. And from a value, it's, it's, it's still a Harris. It's still 1930s subject matter. Uh, I, we do subject ev all of our works in our collection to, to appraisal, but we have no reason to believe that it's going to drastically change. Yeah. So let's get back into the technology a little bit. Oh. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess I'm curious, uh, Germaine, with all the work that CCI does, um, with, with the photography that was done, Mm -hmm. Is it typical to have so much information revealed? Yeah, so, so um, this project was really unique uh, because every single imaging method that I used uh, revealed something uh, about the work, uh, which is really great and not, not always typical with, uh, with different artworks or artifacts. Um, this is really because of the materials that Harris used. Um, if if this particular painting was a was a sketch on a, on a, a rigid board, 
Uh, it wouldn't have been able to use any of the transmitted uh, light imaging. Um, and also uh, things like the uh, visibly induced IR luminescence. Um, that, um, uh, that only works for paintings with like uh, cadmium pigments uh, and cadmium uh, started to be used in like the, the 19th century till now. Um, it can also be used with Egyptian blue, but that's ancient Egypt and you know, there's a big gap between that and the 19th century. But uh, so it sort of falls within that, uh, that time period. So um, yeah, so that was uh, something about the, uh, the artwork that uh, really worked well with the imaging. And also some artists um, might not do like, uh, like grid lines or, or under drawings, uh, but because Harris uh, did, and uh, it's, uh, it revealed itself in the IR. So that's, that's why it was so uh, fruitful. Yeah, exactly, so, yeah. exactly. Is there further analysis or, or research uh, that we could do? Yeah, like, um, again, the IR was really useful. Um, and I think that uh, if we image it further with, uh, with a longer wave um, infrared, uh, it could uh, reveal more or at least just uh, make a clear image uh, for us. Uh, we don't, we don't, it's a specialized camera. We don't, we don't have that uh, particular technology at CCI, but other institutes do. Um, yeah, so uh, there's that. And uh, there's other things like, uh, um, I think a, uh, a pigment analysis could be really useful sort of to get a general characterization of this work. Um, and probably a more broader like analysis of of the materials that he used um, uh, with other uh, with other paintings. Because that was sort of revealing in this process, right? Yeah. Is that in fact Harris ha hasn't had a lot of research uh, done mm -hmm. on his work. Yeah. And so this is really, uh, I think, a beginning. Yes, exactly, exactly. What was what was the most revealing uh, aspect or surprising aspect of this? Uh, surprising aspect, you know, I think it was the swirls at the bottom of the painting. Um, I saw that, that just, uh, I saw it early on in the imaging process and it just kept repeating itself and I really didn't know what to make of it. Really, I thought oh, it could be a compositional element. I didn't know if there was like a, if there's a full painting underneath or whether these are just thoughts that he, he's working out or whether he's just like cleaning his brush off. I, yeah, I just didn't know. And, uh, the real pivotal point was uh, when we took my images and then uh, looked at them and compared them to uh, some of his other works and sketches, and it just it just clicked, it just aligned. I want to come back to that in a moment. Sure. But I want to give a little shout out to the Canadian Conservation Institute because I think a lot of people probably haven't heard of them uh, until today. <laughs> oh, wow. <well, there> are. <laughs> they are an extraordinary uh, department uh, within the Department of, of Heritage. In fact, they help, uh, helped us to build this space as well. Um, and they give us our, our museum designation, which is a very important process. Can you uh, talk about some of the, the range of activities that happen at, at CCI? Uh, at CCI, yeah. Um, so we have a, um, um, a conservation science team that does analysis and, and uh, scientific investigations, but we also have uh, our uh, conservation team that, uh, that conserves a, a wide range of objects uh, from uh, Archaeology to uh, historic furniture, um, uh, paintings, works on paper. Uh, we do textiles, uh, many, many, many different uh, objects, uh, and uh, our uh, our um, uh, preventive pre preventative conservation department um, provides uh, advice and guidance. Uh, and there's there's other departments, and I. I, I don't want to miss them, but uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think what uh, what's revealing uh, in this process is there's just so much work that we can be doing on Canadian art and telling its story yes. uh, in a deeper and, in fact, a more scientific way. Uh, and I think we really are just kickstarting that uh, in so many ways. And so let's go back to Harris's work. Uh, because I think that the process for me, as you walked us through all of those layers, uh, was very revealing in terms of his methodology, in terms of the way that he was moving 
uh, from landscape to abstraction, abstraction to landscape, and really embracing the notion of theosophy, which was essentially trying to find the, the sublime within, within nature. Uh, and I, I feel like you've shown that. You've shown how he was working back and forth and really trying to get to that essence. Um, Rebecca, maybe can you talk, us a little bit, talk to us a little bit more about that philosophy and how it shaped the work that he did. Yeah, for sure. So as I mentioned, he was introduced to theosophy very early on when he was in Germany first studying art. And then J.H. MacDonald, who became his best friend when he came back to Canada, was also a theosophist. The two of them were part of the uh, Toronto chapter, uh, which eventually became autonomous, but of the Canadian Theosophical Society. And they were both, uh, you know, there's lots of writings from Harris, and he wrote for the, the Canadian the Theosophy magazine uh, about, you know, as his ideas were developing over time with theosophy. So theosophy, as Harris understood it, is a philosophy, and it brings together sort of religion, so like Buddhist and Hindu uh, sort of beliefs, in conjunction with science um, and philosophy. And so he thought his mission, you know, he's always moving forward with his practice. His mission was to sort of imbue those works with the theosophical ideas. And so when he went to New Mexico and founded the Theosophical Painting Group, uh, this is sort of where it, it comes to the fore. However, I will say in, in critique of it, um, <laughs> applying these sorts of ideas to the to Canadian landscape for a nationalist agenda, um, it's about this reconnection to nature and everything. Um, there is a bit of a sort of colonial pursuit in there, sort of purging from Eastern philosophy and then um, and then uh, combining it with, uh, you know, a sort of, I need to reconnect back to this land, but really it's not your land. Uh, but uh, certainly at the time, uh, it was very popular among artists, and it was uh, something that pushed that national agenda forward. Absolutely, and it's sort of what the Group of Seven in, in so many ways is kind of known for and, mm -hmm. and creating for for Canada. So I know that there's going to be a lot of burning questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so I do, I do, I'll get to that in, in just a moment. But by, for my final question, uh, I want to again bring it back to the artwork. We know, as you mentioned earlier, uh, that this is one of the most beloved artworks uh, within the Firestone collection. Uh, and you know, I had a conversation uh, with somebody earlier today about why why this piece resonates. Uh, why do you think it? resonates for so many? Um, well, first of all, it's a beautiful piece. I encourage you to go stand in front of it. Uh, there's something about these simplified, majestic forms. Uh, th there's just something about it. But I think um, beyond the aesthetics of the work, um, it will continue to resonate for various reasons, one of which perhaps is environmental reasons. Mount Thule is uh, will not look like that. That's a, that has captured a particular moment in time. Uh, scientific climate uh, change researchers have discovered that Mount Thule uh, is is uh, very much in um, what do you call it? Uh, the, like the glaciers are retreating. Uh, so I think uh, I think there's many reasons why we love this work, but I think it will still, you know. And what I love too is that now we, it, it shows Harris's process. So it's about artistic process, it relates to larger ideas, and it, it's just sort of awesome to be in front of it as well. So with all of this research that was uh, taking place, all of the analysis, has it changed your perspective? I love it more. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Jermaine, how about you? Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, so.